Hello everyone. No one's online yet. Hmm? Hello Alice. Hello Erica. Hello everyone. Hello Russell. Hello Natalie. Hello everyone. I'm just, uh, hi Sophia, I'm just waiting, uh, I'm just waiting to invite Russell and we'll start our conversation. To Russell and um, he'll join us just in a second, I'm sure. Thank you everyone for taking your time and uh, for, here you go, hi Russell. Hey, what's up, hi. How are you? <laughs> Good to fine, see fine. you. Fine, fine. <laughs> High five. <laughs> hey, here we go. Man, you got a nicer set than me. <laughs> really? You? I'm yeah. Hearing you it from you the You dress yours up. You dress oh, okay. yours up. <laughs> well, but great to have you. I will say a few yeah. words about the series and I will do a little bit of introduction and then we'll move into our very well anticipated conversation with you, like all friends. As we always do. Yep. Okay, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Good evening in Singapore and Asia. Good morning uh, for some of you who woke up early in the United States and good afternoon in Europe. And uh, thank you again for joining me for the uh, episode number 13 uh, at Conversations with Olga. I just say a few words about the conversations for some of you who might be joining us first time now. Uh, I started Conversations with Olga last year uh, during the Circuit Breaker, and the, it is an IGTV series fostering intellectual and cultural exchange between my friends, uh, influential individuals from all around the world. They are sharing their personal life uh, in hopes to inspire and cultivate a more diverse and, exclusive co and inclusive community. Um, and as I said, as I mentioned today, it's my 13th episode where I'm welcoming my dear friend for many, many, many years, Russell Wong. Uh, the conversation will be recorded and I will post the link for some of you who are not able to join us live. Uh, link will be uh, on my Instagram and under the conversations and I'm sure Russell will repost it as well from his side. So a little bit, a few words as an introduction about Russell. And then we'll move on to the discussion that is going to be very exciting, I'm sure. Russell Wong, without a doubt, is one of the most profiled photographers, not only in Singapore, but in Asia as well. He is described as a celebrity photographer who also photographs celebrities. Russell enjoys the acclaim of being the first Singaporean to break into the notoriously difficult Hollywood movie industry. He is also one of the elite group of photographers assigned to photograph cover, uh, covers for Time magazine. Popularly known as a photographer of sport legends, of movie stars, of rock musicians, of politicians, Russell also actually developed an amazing portfolio of landscapes, nudes, uh, and uh, still life, and other very compelling conceptual pieces. So his work can be seen on his website www.russellwonkphoto.com if I'm correct uh, to mention that. Is, am I correct? Yep, so Russell, with one L. Yes, yes, Russell with one L. Exactly, absolutely. <laughs> and that's the story behind that. If you want to uh, say a few words about it, you're most welcome. But we'll start with your bringing. You have been born in Melbourne, and um, I believe uh, it was very important for your parents to have a cultural education, to give you a cultural education, which, which actually I can totally relate to because this is the way I was uh, raising my children as well. You drew, you, you were studying, you played piano, you drew, you loved art and was creative since your childhood. Did you ever have a feeling that uh, while growing up that actually you would want to capture life, people, nature and uh, just the world in general through lenses? Um, to put it in a nutshell, uh, I never thought this was going to happen, you know, and, uh, it's just, uh, I just wanted to play football, 
you know, play the park, go play football. That's that's all I wanted to do. You know, that's all I wanted to do. Um, you know, art was just you know it's part of it. It's part of the fun thing. Like all kids, I guess, growing up, and you know, you know, being from uh, this uh, highly motivated Asian family in Singapore, yeah. it was just like you know, um, you got to learn the piano. So we learned the piano and the saxophone and then the clarinet. So this is a music and, and culture, I guess, was always in my family. Um, I, you know, I felt it was normal because my mom yeah, and dad well. just gave us the instruments. Yeah, and and it wasn't I like a weird. I thought it was normal too. Pushing yeah, the, so. Uh... Yeah. Instruments into yeah, like, yeah. the every, life of my every kid plays the piano, clarinet, and the saxophone, right? <laughs> so, oh, the violin! Did, yes, did, yeah. Little did I know I was kind of, um, you know, just okay. You just go do this, but but good came out of it, and uh, to this day, I still appreciate music, uh, appreciate culture, appreciate museums because we were always yes. dragged to museums. Oh, um, yeah, but never, never did I think that that it and was just that I was going to pursue a career, you know. Something creative, yeah. Yeah, something uh, creative. So actually, you, know, you that's uh, what you saw. Yeah, it's a doctor. Exactly. But what was your parents' wish, I would say, or advice uh, for this regards to your career? What what they were hoping for? <laughs> what they were hoping for was really different. <laughs> Nothing sure. like what I became, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a doctor. Um, and, uh, you know... It's like, okay, you go to school, get a degree, uh, you know, work, you know, become uh, a professional, you know, work in a bank or work in a hotel. Or, um, never did they think that this kid of theirs was going to uh, be a photographer. And, and it was just, you know, I, like I said, you know, I, I did not want to have a camera. I wasn't interested in the camera, but dad gave me a camera when I was 16, you know, before I went, you know, before I went to the U.S. to go to college at the University of Oregon, you know, on the West Coast of yeah. America. So, so I never wanted a camera. Then. Yeah, never wanted a camera. Because I hated so, these photo geeks in school. All these photo geeks, you know. <laughs> so this is how it all started? Or did you have any yeah. particular signs of, or incidents of fate? Or you were a uh, hustler to, to get what you really were passionate about? Not really. I, you know, I just, like I said, you know, I was just this aimless kid running around, I was 16, and dad just got me a camera just to take pictures to send it back to mom and dad, because I was the first one to go away and send pictures back, you know, of yourself in college and, and we'll be happy, but little did they know I was just shooting all these athletes and runners and hardly sending pictures back, maybe once in a while, because I was just so engrossed with, with, with you know, using the camera and, and shooting all these uh, amazing track and field athletes, you know, yeah. that was, they were all in my school, you know. Yeah, well, that's, 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 anyway, it looks like it's a sign, it's a, a, a premonition, I should say, to, for you to start yeah. doing it from, from the college days, but uh, I will touch a little bit more on how it all started, and I believe it all mostly started with your photo photography of sports and uh, yep. sports uh, celebrities, but I want to start a little bit about your passion and about your love for Japan. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm actually starting about it uh, to, to start with Japan uh, is because I know that your exhibition, we spoke about it, and you said that your exhibition is coming up uh, very soon in July in uh, um, Asian Civilization Museum. And uh, you, I will ask you a little bit about it a bit later on. But uh, your love for Japan, you even several years ago, you uh, spoke to our very good mutual friend, Stephen Chalavis, spoke at his the one-way ticket show about yeah. uh, one-way ticket to Kyoto. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you about your fascination and admiration about Japan in general and how your uh, photographs inspired by actually my actually by father and son architects, if I'm correct, to say that Kenzo and uh, Paul Noritaka, well, Hanga, correct? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and the spirit of Wa, uh, the Japanese concept concept of harmony. So, is it something that you kind of fell in love due to their work, or why is it so much uh, about Japan that you love? You know, I think uh, you know. I think any any creative person, any designer, um, any photographer, you know, we we see the aesthetics of Japan and we love it because it's so perfectly designed. The you know the culture designs everything perfectly. 
be it, you know, a bowl of noodles or, or, or even wrapping paper or even just uh, a tray, you know, or, or a tea set. Um, and the aesthetics, you know, obviously, and, and the way they do it is not just aesthetically, but that's the way they go about uh, leading their life, you know, um, and it's, everything is like a ritual. Everything is like a ritual. And it's, it's just set up and you just go from point A to point B. You don't ask questions and it just, everyone goes through this ritual, which I think is amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, um, you land in Kyoto and you can't help yes. but think that you are just really locked away in a different world, you know, and it's yeah. so difficult. It's so difficult in this day and age uh, to find a, a city that it's so authentic and so, um, you know, not, not, not really just, it hasn't gone to full modernization, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, you know, everywhere looks the same after a while, right? But, but when you go to Kyoto, you see the wooden machias, you see geikos and maikos, gracious and maikos walking around, Girl, women in kimonos, you know, something you romanced about. And when you saw it in pictures or movies, and you see it right in front of your eyes, happening in front of you, it's like this old movie playing in front of you. That's, a, that's an amazing Absolutely. part. Absolutely. I totally, I love Kyoto and I love old kimonos and I actually collect uh, some wow. of the old hobbies and kimonos. So I, I, uh, uh, I am fascinated, and uh, actually, what I want to ask about specifically about Kyoto, of course, and the uh, in geisha district, because you managed to. Uh, how did you manage to photograph geishas in in their real life? Because they're so uh, secluded and introverted, but yet you capture it and how they entertain, how they relate to one another, how do they relate to the world? Did you need to ask any permissions to do so? And can you please tell us a little bit about it's, this project? It's really complicating. I mean, it's kind of, uh, you don't, you know, they're, they're very, very, very uh, discreet, obviously. You can't just pay and shoot. You know, it's not like a, shooting a model, right? Um, yes. I, I invested, uh, I've been shooting for, I've been shooting there for 13 years. It took me about five years. It took me about five years to even get into the Ochaya or the tea house where they, yes. they perform and they, and they live. You know, um, it's true. Just talking to just random people. So I was acting and and, and becoming like sort of a an investigative journalist. That's how I approached this project. You know, everyone I met, I would ask, "Hey, do you know anyone in the Hanamachi uh, or Kagai? You know, which is like the Geisha district?" Um, yes. And uh, they go, "Oh, sorry, I don't know. I don't know." Uh, I'll ask everyone I meet, <laughs> the cab driver, the real car owner. You know, um, and, and then and I got lucky. And then suddenly people like, okay, I think I know someone that knows someone. And this this happened for about five years. So it was just an amazing journey. <laughs> through some journey. friends, yeah. Yeah, so through some friends too that I met and they were really helpful. Um, and slowly you would get closer and closer and closer till that door opens, you know, because you don't know when this door is going to open. And I was told that you got to be patient. You can't push it. You can't force yourself. Um, and it is like that in Kyoto. So um, it, it, it was quite a complicating process, really. And you can't, it's all about a recommendation in Kyoto, you know. It's not about paying money and getting in. They, they find that rather yeah. vulgar, right? You know, you can buy us. And that's the whole of thing. Of course, of course. Yeah. So we're that the old money, uh, unlike Tokyo, which is a, a novel I guess. It's new. So Kyoto is like the old money side. And they, they pride themselves on being very, very exclusive. You know, um, and, 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 and every, every Japanese will tell you that Kyoto people are one of the most difficult people to understand and to deal with. Because I call it Kyoto Island because it's literally like an island where no one, no other city are like them. You know, it's so unique that way. And then they have this certain amount of thinking. But I had to respect that and figure out how do I go ahead and get into to the houses and the tea houses. And it was actually through... A big part was through food, actually, because the geisha houses do not have a kitchen, and they have to always order food in. So I got to know the people that made the sushi and made the beautiful meals, and like I say, and slowly that like the geisha, the uh, the the sushi girl would like I would. I hope you didn't have to guys yourself, Russell. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't look good in. I don't look good in the kimono or white makeup. <laughs> So, you know, so that happened. And one step at a time, they were very, very kind because they, they saw how badly I wanted the photograph and just not, a lot of people come to shoot it, right? And they shoot postcards and they're out of there. But I told them this is a lifetime project for me. 
I wanted to, you yes. know, no matter how many years it's going to take, I want to document their life in there and, and how, what they go through. Um, so it's, it's, it slowly started, you know, with just some friends in the food business. Uh, and then slowly I got closer and then finally the door opened and the, the, the main uh, one bit this important house in, uh, in Kion, which is like the most prestigious uh, yeah. Asian district. Yeah, they, they allowed me in and they invited me actually to attend a private ceremony. And that's how this whole relationship started after five years. Banging on doors, I guess. I wasn't banging on doors. That's, that's true passion. <laughs> it's a true yeah. passion, Russell. So tell, tell us a little bit about your upcoming exhibition. I believe it's all Kyoto related. And yeah. who is, how is it going to be curated? It's in, um, just for our listeners. It's going to uh, take place in Singapore, an Asian Civilization Museum. Uh, I'm yep. not sure about exactly the dates, but it's... 15th, of April. 16th, 16th, of, 16th, 16th of April. 16th of April. Yeah. 16th of April, all the way to the end of September. And it will be Fantastic. the Asian Civilization Museum. It's called uh, Life in Edo slash Russell Wong in Kyoto. So you got one site, which is Edo, yes. which is the old name, the old name of Tokyo, right? Yes. Um, and it's about the Tokyo site. It's about the past. It's about woodblock printing or ukiyo-e. That's what they call it. Ukiyo-e uh, woodblock printing for Tokyo or Edo site. And then it moves to the present where it slowly moves into Kyoto. And this is when my photographs will, will be in there, uh, yeah. depicting Kyoto and the, the, the Keiko life. I mean, Keiko is actually the, the Kyoto dialect for Geisha. Um, but still kind of photograph in the style of how a woodblock print is usually printed. So I, I, I kind of respect, you know, like the size of the paper, so to speak. You know, so you're going to see beautiful, beautiful master woodblock prints from, from, from Edo beautiful. period in Tokyo. Yeah, like from the 1600s um, all the way to Kyoto, which becomes photography. And that's when you see my work in black, in, 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 uh, in, 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 in uh, using photography as a medium. Very much looking forward, really. And yeah. do you think with uh, these days, with in COVID days, do you think this exhibition will be brought, will travel somewhere around Asia after Singapore? Do you uh, know anything I, I, about I mean, no like... plans for right now. As, as of right now, this is obviously yeah. the first stop. And I mean, I hope, I really hope I, you know, I can, I can bring this show or even an expanded version of this show, obviously, to, you know, even yeah. back to Kyoto or Tokyo and, you know, maybe New York. You know, I, I, I would love to have it travel because yeah, uh, I, I've gotten a lot of images that, that not many people have seen because of just the close quarters of these, uh, you know, of, 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 of uh, Geisha life, right? Of yeah. course, of course. Well, we, I, I can't wait. I'm so much looking forward. Uh, well, now, Russell, let's move a little bit from the beginning uh, of your photographic journey that started with sports and then you moved into their passions. So you have started uh, with sports photography, I believe. Uh, Nike yep. gave you the break, isn't it? Yep. So can you tell us a little bit about the story of uh, how it all happened and uh, how Nike came aboard? And yeah, this, uh, I went to the University of Oregon. So University of Oregon, uh, the, the town was called Eugene, 100,000 people. This is when Nike was invented, where Coach Bill Bauman invented the Nike shoe. Coach Bill Bauman was the head coach of the school in track and field. And uh, so he invented the shoe. And of course, Phil Knight was working with him you know, the, the famous Phil Knight, uh, because Phil was running under Coach Bauman too. Um, well, okay. um, just one, uh, one lazy Sunday, I just rode my bicycle down to the park. And because I found out it through a friend that, um, uh, you know, the great Sebastian Cole, the middle distance runner, the world record holder, uh, yeah. was going to be there to give a running clinic. So I went down with my little camera and my $40 flash I got from Lucky Plaza. Um, my dad got me. Um, and you know, the one roll of Kodachrome film and, and started photographing Sebastian Cole. By that time, he was already the world record holder for four world records, you know, 800, 1500 a mile, and I think 2000. So yeah, this Nike guy brought Seb, you know, brought Seb down because he was a Nike sponsored athlete. And of course, I was so excited. I was just a kid then. I was like 18. I was like 18 then. Um, photographed him just for fun. You know, I was just sitting on the floor and just shot a headshot of him while he was chatting and uh, in, a, in a picnic shed uh, and, uh, and you know enlarged the picture the next day had it in my dorm room 
a friend came by the next day and saw this photograph of Sebastian Cole and said, "Hey, this is a great shot. You gotta go send these pictures or go show Nike these pictures because you're gonna they can give you a pair of shoes or something." <laughs> so I was gonna like, "Wow, I'm gonna yeah." So like, shoes did it for me, and um, so I like okay. So I tried to find the address of the Nike office, and I finally found it. So I, I remember cycling down about easily, easily 15 kilometers in the rain. With my little box of slides in the plastic uh, holder, wrapped up in a rubber band in my backpack, cycled down to the Nike office and went to look for the marketing guy who I got the name from. His name was Jeff. So I like, hey, look, I'm here to see Jeff. Uh, he's the marketing guy, and this guy pops up who I recognized, and he was the same guy that se that that sent Sebastian, you know, to to the picnic shit to do the to do the uh, to do the running clinic. So I like, okay, okay, I see this together, and I was got excited. And Jeff goes, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Here you got some pictures for me. Said, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I I took pictures of Sebastian. Here's a box. Here's a box of slides. Uh, you want to check it out? They say, okay, let me check it out. So he sees it. He said, you know something? Let me hang on to this, because no one took pictures of Sebastian when he was in Eugene. I'm like, oh really? Um, so fine. He said, let me hang on to this. I'll get back to you. Uh, and that was it. So being like this amateur hobbyist. I mean, what do you do? Like, what do you? Like, how do you deal with this business? Someone keeps the slides. What do they pay you? Do they give you shoes? You know, how long do they hang out for? So I had no idea what was going on. So, so I'll get back to you, Russell. Just let me hang on to these transparencies because I shot Kodachrome transparencies. Yes. So I went. I went back that summer. Went back to Singapore in summer. I left Jeff my phone number. Say, look, you need to get hold of me. I'm in Singapore. All right, that's my phone number. I'll be back after summer. Okay, cool. So. When I hit back, when I was back in Singapore, um, about a week or so, I get a call at two in the morning, and the phone rings. My dad woke me up and said, "Hey, look, there's some 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 guy from the U.S. You know, he's calling you at two in the morning. Uh, he wants to talk to you." So I picked the phone up, and on the other side of the phone was this man called John. He said, "Hi, this is John. I'm the editor of Track and Field News, and I would love. I have your pictures of Sebastian Cole." With me, I love it, and we want to use it as a cover. So I'm calling you to ask you for permission. So it's at oh two God. in the morning. I'm going like, you have to ask me for permission. I thought like it's yours already, <laughs> being like 18 year old kid. So like, okay, sure. Uh, yeah, you can have it. Uh, you can uh, you can print it. So he goes, okay, I'll send you a check. So the check was for 150 dollars, about there. So I'll send it to your dorm when you get back to the states. I said, okay, cool. So I was like so happy. I didn't know what to make of it, you know. So I went back home. To, to Eugene, Oregon, went to my dorm. I found my $150 check and I went to the bookstore and I saw all my covers there, which was just, it was just unbelievable. I mean, I didn't know what to think. I, mean, I was 18 then. You know, I see my, my, my first um, published <laughs> photo was the cover of Sebastian Paul. Yeah, so um, I mean, you're a kid then. You don't know, you have no perspective on how things are supposed to work, right? Um, but at that point already, I go, wow, maybe I should explore doing this you know, like to take up this photography seriously, you know. And um, explore you did, you certainly yeah. did. Yeah, uh, so Nike, Nike got, yeah, Nike was so happy. So that's a pure chance. I hope yeah, you still and, have this pair of shoes and you put them yeah. on a sacred place. I, I, I should have, but I was so greedy. They gave me the, they gave me, Jeff gave me the pair of shoes and it was just gone. It was just worn out, you know. And, uh, and he said, look, you know, thanks so much. We got the cover. Do you want to shoot for us? And that's how I got my job. So I was shooting for Nike um, and the deal we had, see, when you're a foreign student, right, Olga, you can't actually technically work, right? Because it's kind of yeah. illegal to work, you know? True. So the way around it was, they, they went, okay, for every six pictures we use, we'll give you a pair of shoes. I'm like, cool. <laughs> so, so I was giving them pictures every I week. I hope you were choosing the most shoes. expensive ones. You know something? I'm from Singapore. We always choose the most expensive one. <laughs> Okay. So, so, okay, but... so I asked him, Jeff, okay, come on, which is the most expensive one? That was exactly what I said. To him. Okay, Russell, these are the Nike Tailwinds. They are $59.95. So that was, that was the most expensive shoe then. $59.95 in the US currency. So Singapore dollars would have been $180. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll get the most expensive one. So I kept on getting shoes and I was running a shoe shop in my dorm. It was like Queensway Shopping Center here. You know? Amazing story. And the uh... Definitely. See, that's a chance, and you never know where, uh, where 
we should expect any of any of the chances exactly. that come to our life. And um, how did you gravitate to the fashion photography? Of course, uh, I know that uh, 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 that you were a big fan of uh, 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 Richard Avedon, and uh, you followed and you looked at, I'm sure, read and saw the books of uh, yeah. Helmut Newton and uh, uh, Irving Penn. And I know that uh, you actually met uh, Richard Avedon in yep. your life. And, uh, you are called, actually, you are referred to as the Richard Avedon of Asia by so many, and I've heard it myself. So what uh, was it uh, a start for you? What was it a start for you when you kind of uh, learned and met uh, Richard Avedon? What uh, no, it's, made uh, you I'll tell you, gravitate uh, to passion? So I was, shooting, I was shooting sports for four years already. And I was just sick of shooting sweaty men, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Running around in tights. <laughs> So I got, it's got to be something better than this, you know. So my friend sends me, my friend gives me a GQ magazine. Because, I mean, I was like a sports illustrator guy. I didn't care about fashion, yes. right? I mean, my mom was in the fashion because my mom's a shop, shopaholic. To this day, she's a shopaholic. So, so, so we kind of knew the brands, like the Prada, the Ferragamo and all that, you know. So we knew that. We grew up with that. And um, it was just, you know, I just wanted to do something I felt that I could create from scratch. Because in sports photography, you know, it's there for you to document to shoot, right? You're not creating from scratch. Uh, yeah. And my friend showed me. My friend showed me this beautiful double-page ad. I still remember. I looked at it. I go, wow, now this is what I want to do. What is this? Well, it was a double-page spread of a Gianni Versace ad that Richard Avedon shot. I never knew who this Richard Avedon guy was. I mean, later on, I found out who this photographer was. When I went home to Singapore, and, you know, we went to our friend's place. Uh, you know, we have a mutual friend, Tina. So went to the Versace yeah. shop, oh, yeah, oh, with Tina's place, and because Tina yes. had a Versace shop at the Mandarin Hotel, and I went through the catalogs because someone told me, hey, there's a Versace boutique in Mandarin, you should go there and check it out. So went there, grabbed the catalogs. I remember saw, this shop very, very well. Yeah, on the mezzanine level, right? So uh, yeah, and and then I then I started researching who's this photographer. Oh, it's Richard Avedon, New Yorker, New York photographer, and uh, what this fashion photography was about. Because I felt that it was like, wow, it's something that I wanted to do. Because this was kind of, you started with a blank slate and you could create and put whatever you yeah. want in the frame as opposed to, you know, documentary or sports photography where it's there for you to shoot. So I, yeah. I just played around with it and got friends and started shooting friends, started shooting local celebrities in Singapore, um, people in the fashion business when I was going clubbing. You know, uh, I went to this club where all the models were at, all the designers were at, all the creative people were at. It was an amazing club in Singapore called My Place. It was a private club. And uh, I was lucky to meet all the up-and-coming people. And they were all my guinea pigs, so to speak, because I was starting out. And I fell right into fashion photography because it felt natural. You know, I felt I knew the brands. I knew the clothes. I was familiar with it because mom yeah. would drag us shopping. And you know how the kids are just scream and shout. Yes. Okay, sit down here while I try my pair of shoes. You know, and you kind of pick up the brands and names, right? You're kind of familiar. And dad was like, crazy about his Italian shoes. and So, you know, I was quite comfortable in terms of being around that whole fashion. Russell, scene. what was your first uh, magazine that you uh, published, uh, that published your fashion photography? Actually, it was a local magazine. And who Herwell. was the model? Herwell. Herwell, oh. Herwell was the first local or first fashion magazine I ever had published. And this is when I came back from Oregon. I was doing national service. So while I was doing national service, and I was actually a photographer in, in, yeah. in, the army, in the army magazine, right? So on weekends, I would shoot my fashion stuff because I knew I, was, I wanted to do that. I knew I wanted to go to school. So I had to build this portfolio up. And uh, yeah, I got my first cover shooting, um, shooting for Her World magazine, you know, uh, which is still around, right? It was the biggest local magazine then because we never had any foreign magazines at that time. Yes. You know, it was all local magazines. And it was great. All local models, which is great. So the industry was very, very young. And I was also up and coming with the industry. And we all started out together. All the big models that people know now, like Ethel Fong and Pat Crawl and Hannes. So uh, they were like the, the, the trailblazers, you know, in this industry. But um, I, I, I shot and I just got so engrossed with it. And I was lucky to have people to shoot with because I was with and in the fashion community and the entertainment community you know, um, hanging out yeah. with them every weekend, you know. Um, and then finally built a portfolio and applied for school in, in uh, Los Angeles to go to a proper art school in LA. Yeah. 
That's right. So you lived, thank you, you lived many years in LA, but you also traveled from LA yeah. to New York. And uh, yeah. it's a huge difference between, New, obviously, LA and New York. And uh, uh, what does it take to actually break into the New York scene and uh, to get to be known there? And how did uh, you feel about New York of that time? And then how did it influence your career? You know, obviously, you know, everyone I looked up to were all based in New York, like Richard Avedon, you know, yeah. um, Irving Penn. These were my two heroes when I was starting out. And, you know, Irving Penn, Richard Avedon, wow, I don't think there'll be anyone like them. Um, and I, you know, and they were all based in New York. So I figured that's a new, that's a place to be because all the magazines, as you know, are based there. I mean, no serious magazine or no serious fashion magazine is based in Los Angeles. Yes. Right? They're all, they're all in on Madison, all the big magazines come and ask everyone. So that was one of my goals, obviously. So I traveled there off and on, show them my book. And you know, every single time it's like, oh no, no, sorry. Oh, maybe next time. Oh, you know, you, it's it got so bad when it, no, I mean, they never even saw you personally. If you saw the guy in the magazine personally, that was like, whoa, I'm so happy to see you in person for you to turn me down, you know? <laughs> because it was just stick this note in your book. You just stuck, everyone stuck this note in your book. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Show me new stuff six months down the road. So, you know, I, I, I never, for, for quite long, I, I didn't get any work out of uh, New York, you know. Um, and then, of course, slowly, you know, I, I, got, I got better. I started shooting more celebrities in LA. And, of course, then I would do magazines, you know, for, 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 for New York. They were based in New York. But, of course, all the celebrities were living in LA. So I would not, yeah. have, I would not shoot in New York, but I would shoot in LA. And of course, right, but offer you know, it to New York. Exactly, right? exactly. So, yes. so that was my my slow breakthrough. And uh, but it's tough. It's tough in New York. I mean, all the best, the best people are there. You know, all my heroes are there. You know. Um, I know it's but, tough. Uh, I'm from New York. I know it's tough. It's you know, you pl probably you were a good hustler. You probably learned how to hustle yep. when you were a child. I, I hustled pretty good. Mastered yeah, it I, when you were dealing with yeah. New York. I'm sure. I mean, you not just to. New York, all the, yeah, because you got to understand, I mean, you know, you're starting out. I don't have an agent, right? So I'm like the secretary. I'm like the human resource. I'm like the marketing. It's just me and my portfolio knocking yeah. on doors, calling, meeting all the museum editors, meeting all the, the, the publicists for the movie stars. It was just a one-man show, and that's all you have. Yeah. So, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, you know, showing people my work, uh, enjoyed meeting new people, and, and uh, uh, you know, so the marketing part will be showing people your work and then I would try to shoot and build my book up by going to clubs. So I'll go to all these clubs. There was a Tuesday club, there was a Wednesday club, there was a Friday club because you could meet these people there or at least uh, uh, the celebrities or the actors or the musicians without the without them managers. Yeah. No managers, no bodyguards. I don't have to deal with these people around me. It's totally a different story. When they exactly. One-on-one, on one, you're sitting in the same bonquette with them, hanging out. Yes. And I would hang out. After school, I would hang out in the jazz bars. Every single Monday, I would be at this jazz bar called the Baked Potato, right? And uh, that's like the most legendary jazz bar in, in, in Los Angeles. Um, and all the big jazz people were there. And that's how I got one of my first musicians that, I, that was known and I started shooting. Because that was like, I call it the separate life. The school life was until like eight, nine o'clock at night. And then yeah. after nine, you, you find me the jazz bar. Yeah. Incredible. And you know, uh, this all this, you shot actually 17 covers for Time magazine. Yeah. And you have been renowned as a Time cover photographer. Uh, what was the most memorable uh, Time magazine cover? Is it... Uh, Shall I guess it was it Lee Kuan Yew or uh, maybe no? I, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't shoot uh, Lee Kuan Yew for the cover. It was an inside spread, actually. Yeah, I oh, did an inside spread spread. when he okay. passed away. Yeah, yeah. But but that was that was great in the end, you know, to to have an inside spread of your own, you know, your old uh, old prime minister in it, you know. And this was uh, the issue when he passed away. So that was that was that was amazing for me, you know, personal reasons because you know I'm from Singapore, right? So, uh, but. Yeah, the Jackie Chan cover was, of course, very memorable because Jackie was, you know, jumping around the middle of the street. I had him there sitting in the middle of the road in Kowloon. Um, and Jackie's, you know, a good friend and, and uh, let alone to do a cover of Jackie. I mean, when his movie Rush Hour, Rush Hour exploded to, I think, 200, 200 million or something, uh, they wanted him to do the cover. And so he called out, the manager called up 
and the magazine called out, "Hello, you're the only guy that can shoot Jackie. Your friends, uh, let's go, let's do it." So, so that was very memorable, and he was really, really kind because on the night we were shooting, it was pouring. It was that was this ty typhoon happening, and Sunday at eight it cleared up, but they were looking for a backup. I said Russell, do you have a backup? Uh, no. Nope. This is my only idea. I want you sitting in the middle of the road with the neon lights behind, right? So, and Jackie goes, hey, look, that's a great shot. That's a good visual. That's a good idea. Let's roll with it and let's not do a backup shot. So we just sat in the bus until the rain. So direction, direction and guidance basically yep. always comes from you. And yep, they it's listen. all me. Yep. yep. So I'm not that's just the guy that just clicks the shutter, right? So I want to yes. come up with the idea. I want to come up with the idea kind of be the creative director, you know, and uh, and because I can see this image and I run it through the magazine and they go, okay, fine, that's a great idea. Let's roll with it. So, uh, yeah, Jackie was like, he's like jumping around in the middle of the road with no bodyguards and no people stopping traffic behind him, you know, and uh, yeah, we got that done. People thought we were shooting a movie, actually. <laughs> the photographer well, and Jackie in the middle of the road. Yeah, they thought we were shooting, maybe they're shooting Rush Hour 3 or something, you know. So maybe that gave you an idea to move into the movie industry because filmmaking has also been a very impactful one in your career and in your life. You have directed numerous award-winning commercials as well as you've been involved as in, in a number of feature movies and, uh, uh, and documentaries and uh, obviously ad campaigns. Uh, I would, uh, you photographed, of course, many movie actors, movie celebrities besides all the other celebrities, including... Uh, Tom Cruise and Madonna and uh, Michael Jackson and Sidney Crawford and Isabella Rossellini, just to name a few, even, even Anthony Bourdain. Just and, to drop uh, a couple of names. Ash Ashwarya <laughs> Rai and everyone. And of course, all the Asians, all the Asian major Asian stars and directors and uh, publicity shoots for Oliver Stone's Heaven and Earth and uh, uh, for Liang's Crouching Tiger, Hidden, Hidden Dragon, and uh, you name it, you photographed. Uh, um, can you tell us about your involvement, uh, especially your direct involvement uh, in the um, Asian movie scene, and of course about the movie hit uh, Crazy Rich Asians, because I know that I believe, and you told me, and I remember that also, that the first uh, people uh, whom executive uh, producer John Pinotti approached was you. He contacted you, and you have appeared as yourself, as a photographer, Russell Wong, uh, and uh, in this bo uh, box office uh, heap. So tell us a little bit about your immersion into the Hollywood uh, and Asian filmmaking. Um, it started actually, uh, obviously, in, in Hong Kong and China. So uh, the first big film that uh, they invited me on uh, to do the publicity was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. So we did the covers for Time magazine uh, for, you know, and of course, Ang Lee was a, a director. Uh, my friends, uh, so, so it's good to have friends in high places, you know. <laughs> so, but at that time already, yes. and this was this was this was 1999. I was really good friends with Michelle, Michelle Yeo, and uh, that was Chow Yun Fat, and was Michelle. No one knew who Zhang Ziyi was, right? She was she was the new girl that they they hired to be the lead. Uh, yeah, and, and I went up and and, and uh, photographed on the set a bit, and then by the time the movie exploded, you know, time went to them on the cover. Uh, I was working very closely with Bill, Bill Kong, the, the, the producer. And of course, Bill put these amazing projects together. And of course, and Ang Lee, I mean, come on, you know, who doesn't want to work with Ang Lee? I think one of the yeah. most amazing directors in the world, you know. Uh, and so I had a chance to work on his film, do some of the publicity. Uh, and then it led, from that, it led on to Chang Yimou. And then Chang Yimou let me on the set because Chang Yimou saw my pictures. And that was on Hero with Jet Li and Tony Leong, Chang Zi again. And uh, uh, Maggie Cho. So suddenly I was like, I kind of like was hanging out in China. So Heroes, again, was a phenomenal film by Zhang Yimou. So that was the first film I worked with Zhang Yimou. And then later, so Yimou got me again and the producer got me again. Because the same producer, actually, as Crouching Tiger, got me to do House of Flying Daggers. You know, I uh, got to do, um, after that, uh, Curse of the Golden Flower with Kong Lee. You know, um, yeah. and then later on, again, working with Ang Lee again with Last Caution that won the best film, you know, for the, the amazing award for the Venice Film Festival. Yeah. So, Venice. yeah, so that one, so that was all the Asian side. But then again, I was felt, I felt very, very happy that 
I was working with the best actors, the best directors in the whole of Asia, you know, maybe the world, you know. So there wasn't this urge, oh, I need to shoot a Hollywood movie star because everyone was looking to Asia, right? After Crouching yeah. Tiger. So that, that, was, that set the standard. And I yeah. was helping them with the publicity and making it really sexy, making it really cool uh, and having all these pictures run in America and in Europe. Because until that time, no one does stories on Asian films. It was all the small little captions, small little back page stuff. So I got my agent in New York to kind of, hey man, let's splash it. Let's, let's get some amazing images. So that's what we did. We flooded the, 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 the market with all these images that I had because I had an outlet in New York, uh, my, my agent there. Um, and then from then, you know, I guess I was just, I pretty much worked with nearly everyone in Asia or anyone that was big, that was global. You know, and I've, I've always only wanted to work with people that were in the, on a global scene, you know, because it was just, that's how I, I, I everyone thinks, right? You know, um, and, and, you know, Americans want to ask you to shoot all these Asian stars and they obviously go, okay, it's Michelle and you tune fat and, and, uh, and Tsui and Gong Li. And these are all the similar names come up because they were the only ones that the West knew. And yes, I, the, I, they're definitely international yeah. stars. Exactly. So they weren't just Asian movie stars just stuck in Asia, but the West knew about them. So yeah. that was my advantage because they were all friends of mine. I knew how to get hold of them. And I could set up all these shoots because I was on all yeah. the movies. And I was like the only guy on the set. There were no other foreign photographers. So in a way, it was a bit of a monopoly, which is fine with me. You know? <laughs> I'm not complaining. Uh, and then, of yeah. course, then, then fast forward, Crazy Rich Asians come, comes along and, and uh, uh, the, the, the ex uh, executive producer, chairman, uh, uh, Robert um, from Ivanhoe, you know, told me that his, uh, his CEO from Ivanhoe Pictures was John Pernotti, right, who's an executive yeah. producer for Crazy Rich Asians. So John called me, got my number from Robert, and then said, hey, look, we're doing this film. It's called Crazy Rich Asians. Have you read the book? We're coming to Singapore, and you need to show us around. And you need to kind of brief us on the whole culture and everything about the book. Because you're from Singapore, and you're also in the movie industry, kind of. Uh, and yeah, I was more than happy to, to, to give them the inside scoop and tell them and give them the background. Because uh, Singapore is complicating in terms of culturally. Right, yes. yeah, everyone's all mixed. Okay. You got the yes. Hokkien, and even within know. the Chinese community, yeah, yes. even within the Chinese community, it's all you know dialect groups. They're different, yes, so you've got to understand that. Way of knowing the culture, traditions, and manners yeah. and etiquette comes yeah. uh, handy, absolutely. Yeah, so you don't want a Hollywood, you know, like the usual Hollywood guy comes in <laughs> and just whitewashes or whatever, you know, like what they say. They put every, it's, it's just everyone's the same. It's just one country. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so no. I just I wanted to make sure it was done at least sensitively, you know, in terms of have some sensitivity to the culture and the nuances. And this, you can only get it from a local person to give you the, the, the information. You know, because I live here, right? You guys don't live here. You guys live in, in LA. When the movie's done, they get, they get, they get out of you here. You live here, but, but you also know here, the culture of America. Getting all the feedback. Yeah, so I mean, I've got some skin in this game, you know? I got some skin in this game, so, so of course I care, you know, because I'm, I'm part of it, right? But Russell, it also, you know, brings me to a question that, you know, of course, these uh, Asian uh, movie stars and celebrities, they, they have been your friends and you develop a friendship with them perhaps even before you start shooting them, but what kind of relationship in general do you need to develop with your subjects uh, in order to capture their souls, their emotions, and how... Do you, how, how to make them trust you? How do you work on that? That's a very good question. So when you go on a date, how do you make the girl trust you? Oh. <laughs> it's kind of... It's kind it's of... Kind of, okay. it's, so kind it's, of like, it's kind of like that. You know, like, it's just... It's, yeah, like you said, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's about the trust. You know, it's about yeah. the trust. If they don't trust you, even a director... The director yeah. is not going to get a performance from the actor or actress, right? But you know, so, it's never me, in the same industry as me. I think yeah. uh, my clients exactly. they have to trust me and we develop the relationship, they build the relationship, and loyalty yeah. comes out of it. So I totally yeah. understand. That. You know, yeah. but you don't have you don't have a month to have a relationship before you shoot. That's the difficult part. Yes. You know, I got I like I got like an hour to let them trust me while they're doing their makeup. <laughs> so that's a, yes. that's a tough part. So, I mean, yes. you know, I try to be sincere as possible and very honest as possible. Um, and also, I, I do so much research, 
like if I'm shooting a movie star, I'm, I'm see all the movies. If I'm shooting a rock star, I'm listening to all this this rock music. I, I find out background stuff, stuff he likes, stuff he doesn't like, stuff he likes to eat, stuff he likes not to do, you know? So you kind of like, yes. okay, you kind of like kind of know the person and, you know, yes. um, so that helps because when you have this conversation with the person and when they feel that they, you know them, I think there's yes. a bit of respect there already. Right? Well, yes. Yeah. So I can go, oh man, on this album, I remember you sang on the second track and who was playing the bass and this guy was on drums and, you know, uh, and they go, wow, you know the album. So they go, okay, this guy's, this guy's really, he really cares. So that's, that's part of the, the, the thing that, to me, I can have this conversation with them about themselves, about their projects. So right off the bat, they do trust you. Um, and uh, I, I, when I direct, I, I give them a reason. And most people that direct don't give them a reason. Like, you know, look to the right, look to the right. Don't look to the left, look to the right. You know, they don't tell them why. Like, so I give them the motivation, okay? So the right is a beauty light. That's where it's at. That's where the great light for you is. So like they feel like you're taking care of them, you know, and, 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 and sincerely, I, I truly care for my subjects I, I shoot because I, mean, I care about people in general. I like hanging out and talking to people. That's my nature. Yes, so it's I no problem for me to make them look good and to be on their side. Yeah. 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 But so so I'm always on the side of the subject. That's wonderful. But nevertheless, uh... Uh, who was your most difficult celebrity to shoot? Um, the Oliver Stone one is really tough, the director. Because yeah, I caught okay. him on a bad day. I caught him when he was really tired after shooting for like 12 hours. And, but we had to do the shoot. And he agreed to the shoot. But he was really tired. So when I shot it, he saw the pictures. He like, man, I really hate these pictures. I look so tired. You better mm -hmm. burn the negatives. I like burn the negative. So I'm going like, okay, there goes my career, right? He's asking me to burn the negatives. And they'll hear, oh, you know, the whole uh, world's going to hear about it. But but they made it up. They made it up. They scheduled another shoot. And um, okay, uh, yeah, we, we, he, he did the makeup thing. I, came, I went back to Phuket again. That's where the movie was being shot, uh, Heaven and Earth. And, you know, we shot again. He was happier. He was all fresh. So oh, we kind of, you know, but, but it's, it's always still heart-wrenching when someone go, goes, Man, I really hate the pictures you did. Oh. Yes, of course. I don't care how long I don't care how long you're in the business. Of course. Right? Yes. Uh, it, of course. It's hard to take sometimes. You know. Yes. Uh, but if you give me another shot, I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. And hopefully it doesn't happen too often, you know. Your confidence, I'm sure, was uh, uh, question question questionable hey, for It's you, Oliver for Stone, the oh. biggest director then, right? <laughs> Platoon, of course, born of on the fourth of July, JFK. He's telling you in your face, burn the negatives. <laughs> I, I saw my whole career go up in smoke. <laughs> but, you know, nevertheless, um, it all went really well and uh, you managed yeah. to shoot so many incredible people, including Imelda Marcos and including yeah. uh, Lee Kuan Yew. How was it yeah. to uh, photograph Imelda Marcos? How? How was her day, <laughs> Miss Karen? Do you want to know the real story? <laughs> Of course, no, I want the real story. No, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't see the shoes. Was, I, want to know. I didn't see the 3,000 shoes because she got the stuff out of there, the palace. It's in storage somewhere, probably. Oh, I but see. Oh, she was my very. God. Yeah. But I mean, being from Asia, we all grew up. We all grew up seeing these politicians, right? These iconic, yeah. like, untouchables. I just saw them on TV and suddenly you're sitting on the same couch and talking to Imelda Marcos. You know, so that was kind of strange, yeah, but in a weird way, in a, in a good way, rather. Uh, yeah, and and uh, like for me, it was just all right. Once I'm once I'm locked into the groove, I just like you the way I like, and irregardless who you are, so I, I get into the photo mode. Um, and it was very very uh, interesting because she gave me. I remember the contract was just thirty minutes. All she gave me was thirty minutes, in the in the uh, near part of the house. So I was like rushing to set the lights up, you know, and to try to get the shoot going on. Because I, I wanted to do as many pictures as possible. And I was doing the first shot. And I was like rushing. And she's like, Russell, you work really fast. Is there a reason? I says, well, uh, Mrs. Marcos, you gave me 30 minutes, you know. Um, she goes, oh, you know something? Don't worry about it. Because my late husband, the President Marcos, told me that all you photographers are masters. We have to give you as much time. Because, now listen to this, because photographs are permanent. So I like, See, you know that's something? very true. Yep. Good point. You know, 
you you yeah, just uh that, that 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 was how she saw it. So I, I took my time and then started you know doing the stuff and started shooting her and and the, the half hour became an hour and a half. She had totally enjoyed it, and then we had coffee after that, you know, um, on, on the couch. Uh, yeah, and and these moments to me, I remember. It's not just about the photo, right? Um, yeah, and of course, you know, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was phenomenal. It's a memory. It's a memory. It's a relationship. Yeah. I'm sure you probably keep uh, relationships with many of your subjects who become friends yeah. and who the most of them. I mean, most of so them. Much. Actually, most of them all go become become uh, friends and we stay in touch, yes. you know, as much as we can in this crazy yes. world, you know, because they're of always course. in a different town. Of course. Uh, and the ones that, the ones that are nicer, I kind of keep. <laughs> yes. So the nice That's ones, great. the nice ones I keep, you know, the, the not so okay ones, okay, you guys can have this one on social media. The, the other yes. ones I, 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 I try to keep. Of course. That's fascinating. And Russell, besides you, as I mentioned in the beginning, you being the celebrity photographer for the celebrities, and you also you photograph incredible scenes of nature, and uh, your some of your um, uh, photographs look like paintings, like Asian paintings, and one of them was so I. Uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. At least one of them was sold at Christie's for about uh, forty thousand US dollars. Uh, what do you think this particular subject, uh, why did the particular subject took such an incredible liking? Um, of, was, I believe they're on it was time. A, they don't come. Uh, landscape was, bumble, right? Nature, nature is always on time. They don't complain. Like no actresses. <laughs> Their hair is always well. <laughs> you know, but, but seriously, well, it's depends just... Um, on, it depends on the weather. Exactly. So the whole weather thing, you know, sometimes they don't cooperate, uh, but I can deal with that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it started, to tell you honestly, when I was working on Chang Yimou's film, House of Flying Daggers. So we were shooting in a bamboo forest. I decided to bring my huge 8 by 10 view camera with a negative, you know, to the to bamboo forest because I've never been to a bamboo forest. So yeah. I started shooting the amazing forest before they started the movie. And just for myself, right? Not for the movie. <laughs> Um, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's like I had it in a museum and, and, and the auction houses started calling up, Christie started calling up. So that was like, oh, wow, maybe there's something here because I was pretty lucky. And I'm going to the most beautiful locations in China because yeah. Yimou, Zhang Yimou picks the most beautiful locations and I would just photograph the landscapes and I would find extra landscapes for me to shoot because I was so into it. Um, but but uh, in school, we were taught to, 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 to deal with landscape because... Uh, Ansel Adams, a famous photographer out of San Francisco. Ansel set up part of the program in my school. So we kind of knew the zone system and we knew how to shoot landscapes and, and the technical side of it. So I, I that kind of went in one year and it stuck in there for a while. Yeah. Although I didn't think I was going to use it, right? I was just shooting. I was a people shooter. Um, yeah, but but that was so therapeutic. It got me out, got me hiking, got me a new wardrobe. I got hiking pants and hiking shoes and matching hat. So the wardrobe was a bit different. So I would just so love this. Can, I, and can go, I say yeah. that when you shoot the celebrities and when you shoot people, you yeah. uh, kind of showcase their souls. But when you were shooting the nature and these landscapes, perhaps it gravitated to your own soul and you expressed your own soul through these uh, uh, photographs. Yeah. I think it's I just... Think. I mean, the, the common denominator would be the feel, the atmosphere, the light. Even yeah. you know, if you see, uh, there is there is a consistency I can see, and I look for it. You know, um, my landscapes are very atmospheric, a lot of shadow, a lot of dark, just like my yeah. my my portraits. My portraits have a lot yes. of deep dark shadows. You know, very yeah. true. Yeah, chiaroscuro, right? The Italian word for light and dark. Yes, yes. You know, uh, the, and painters like Carav uh, Caravaggio. Uh, this were yes. people. There was a painter that I, I really loved, you know, um, because of the deep dark shadows, directional light, which is how I light. I use only one yes. source of light, and that's how they painted. They used a window light yes. when Caravaggio yes. was painting. Um, and, and you see that in my landscapes, although it's like bamboo forest. The shadows are deep and dark, and usually there are, there's no detail in the shadow. Yes. That's, that's part of my look, I guess. Uh, and I, I, I use that, that concept of light and dark and I apply it to the landscapes from the people, from yeah. the fashion, from the portrait. Yeah. yeah. And like I say, I mean, most photographers, I guess, uh, most people, I think they are more, 
uh, they're more um, sensitive and they're more concerned about what they like, meaning where the highlight is, where the light hits a subject. But I'm more concerned, actually, what the shadow looks like. So I'm not the other way around. Yeah, and I try to control the shadow because that's going to be the look of my photo. So I mean, light is light. You know, light is going to be everywhere, but but it, I, I want to control the shadow. So that's how I, I what that's what I do to get the look. I get the you know even for my like you see the landscape, right? I mean, it doesn't cooperate with you. I pack. I, I wake up at four thirty. I go to the set. Go to the scene. The light's not right. I go back and I sleep and have a, a cafe. Just like a, just like a painter. That's how exactly. Yeah. The painter artists work. They they don't yeah. paint. And they don't express themselves unless the light is right for them in their yes. mind. It's beautiful. So, Russell, you published two books, I believe, right? One yeah. is on your portraits, and another one is on Singapore Symphony. And I know yeah. personally, you know, I always believe that the book is a passport of the individual who wrote and published it. And this is how I felt when I published. Uh, my own book, uh, save the date and to believe it or not, I, I saw that. I saw that huge book of yours. Boy, that's yes. a huge book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. But it's it's it's. I put my soul and my energy and my feelings into it. And to believe it, you know, believe it or not, when I when I see my book on the shelves, uh, uh, even up to now, the next two important titles, for example, like Walk Entertainment to others, it really makes me feel good. So how does it feel? for you to see your books among actually the most important photography books? I mean, of course it feels great, right? I mean, you know, you, you're in a, the, the coffee table book photography section and, and you see your name and your book there together with the people you admire, you know, as long as they don't put it, as long as they don't put it in the comedy section, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm fine with it. <laughs> Keep it in the uh, photography they're section. Wouldn't, they're wouldn't there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, books are, are for the, I mean, are great. You know, it's a whole body of work just bound together. And I, I would well, like I to hope do there will be another that. book on Kyoto and on geishas. One yeah, day. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Working right? on it. I'm working Wonderful. on it. It's we'll out. have another conversation on that yeah. when it's going to be published. And yeah. as a photographer, what are your milestones to reach? Uh, is there any in particular in fashion, movie, politics, or any other world that you would really like to shoot? Uh, you know, gosh, it's endless. You know, that's why we, we keep shooting as a portrait photographer or, or uh, you know, people that just, uh, you know, just shooting personalities. I mean, it's endless, right? It's endless. Just as you thought you're done with it, but then you're never done with it because there's always someone interesting that comes up. That, that, that is what makes this business, what I do, really interesting. You're never, there's not, you know, there's never a shortage of people to shoot. Because still to this day, there's still so many people I want to work with that I haven't worked with, musicians and actors and politicians, you know, uh, and it's anyone interesting uh, for me and actually people that are kind of cultural icons, whether you like them or not. So it's not whether I like them and I think history will judge for itself uh, and, and uh, you know, someone that affects the world in a good way and a bad way. Uh, that, that is like right now, I mean, these are like cultural icons, you know, people that you just talk about and, and will always be around, like the Jackie Chan's will always be around, you know, for the rest of our lives. Uh, you know, when yeah. we all dead and gone, people will still talk about him, or, or, or the American presidents, or, or the prime ministers, or the people that founded these countries around Asia. Uh, you know, and I think just some, some just interesting people for me, you know, can be a world champion, right? A world chess champion. Uh, I love world chess. I love chess champions. I got something about, you know. Yeah, so I, I, I had a chance... Um, shoot Kasparov, you know, Gary Kasparov. Yes. Um, yeah, and, uh, he and has the a very intense, uh, it seems to me, character. Extremely yeah, intense. I think, I think he's the smartest guy in the world. I think, maybe. Maybe, you know, I, I don't be. know. To, to me, them. yeah, to me, you know, if you can, be, if you can beat a computer, if you can beat Big, big Blue, yeah. you know, you've got to be smart if you beat a computer in chess. So anyway, that's more a personal thing and I've always looked up to this chess uh, world champions like Bobby Fischer, you know. So to me, my my interests are so varied, you know. I mean, in one moment, I can talk to you about, you know, what I'm saying I can talk to you about uh, jazz singers and I just and exactly. Legends. But this is yeah, how then, you and me connected originally so many yeah. years ago because we both like jazz very very much, and uh, yeah. this is also common ground even in our friendship with you. Of course. So uh, you know, and if if you think about it, if you think about it. 
photography, at least what I do is, and how I conduct shoots and how it is, it's very much like jazz. You know, I mean, jazz has a form, right? It's got a form of yes. whatever, eight bars or 16 bars. Boom, the melody kicks in and then they improvise after that 16 bars Absolutely. or that, yeah, that structure. So like for me, it's like I have this idea in my head like what the picture is going to look like. And I always have an idea that like people ask me, oh, like, how do you kind of plan it? Well, I just plan it. And I see the shot before I walk in the studio. Yeah. So I already know how I'm going to light this guy and what the background is going to look like. I have this idea already. Because if you don't have an idea, you, you, you know, you're going to be fussing yeah. around. And you feel stuff that, I think, energetically. Yeah. You, have a, you have a strong intuition, I'm sure. Yeah. So I think and about it and I have this idea anyway. And like jazz, you yeah. know, and then after the idea, after you shoot that idea of yours and stuff happens on the set and yeah. uh, actor or actress or your subject does something. And that's when the improvisation comes in on the, the magic yes. on the set, they call, you know, uh, about that, that's the magic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Talking about improvisation, you know, what do, what is your take on the, on this modern day mobile phone photography? You know, that sometimes I look at the pictures and uh, uh, there's, some of the photographs <laughs> on social media are so yeah. photoshopped and there are no, then all the emotions are well, muted. So what is, uh, how much photoshoot is too much and how much is it enough? What is your take on that? How much is too much? Is when you don't look at yourself, that's too much. <laughs> yeah. when you, hey, when you're eight, when you're seventy and eighty, and suddenly you look eighteen, I think that's too much. You know, I mean, there is a line, <laughs> right? I mean, so it's just, I don't know how else to put this. You know, um, yeah, obviously, it's like it's it's ridiculous after a while, yeah. but but that's that's more for themselves, more for the vanity, right? I mean, I'm not there to do that. I hardly use Photoshop. You know, I I try to use as good a light as I can, but I hardly use Photoshop because I think it's just. You, you you alter the DNA of the picture. I I don't think that's yeah. right. I don't think that's right. Yes, that's why. To me, you take out the soul of the person. Yeah. Uh, to them, you're taking out your... the lines of the person. <laughs> that's yeah. good. And what is your advice to the young photographers? It's I mean, to me, it's just to right? try stuff. Yeah, try to capture as as good as as it gets, or what you see in front of your mobile phone or your camera, and not try to. How um, important is the camera actually? Is it, uh, I mean, uh, is it only this, mostly the skill and the feeling of the subject or more than any kind of equipment? It's a, it's a person that clicks a shutter. I'm telling you that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a person that clicks a shutter. It's not about the camera, it's a person that clicks a shutter. I agree. You know, so, so train your eye, try stuff that you haven't tried um, and actually try not to alter so much of it, you know, because if not, you can just cut and paste everything, right? Try to look for a nice scene. Try to look for shadow. Try to look for details. You know that, that it's a beautiful world out there for you to capture without you messing around with it. You know, right? So uh, yeah. I, I've always tried. I mean, that's that's the beauty of it. When you walk in a park, when you walk through old ruins or buildings in Europe, you see nice textures. You see nice. I mean, why do you want to change that? You know, seriously. You know, like it's been around for ages, right? And it says it's it says uh it's lasted the test of time. So and there's a reason why it lasts the lasts test of time because it's so it's so timeless, you know, it's so timeless and it's it's just classically designed the buildings or you know, and, and light is just universal, right? Yeah. yeah. Just for you to, to pick out the nice light lit areas. I think that's part of the fun of photography when you go out and walk around and shoot. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, you know, it's wonderful to talk to you. Uh, because when you and me meet up, it, usually it's the jazz club or we have a quick coffee. Yeah. So actually, uh, I'm grateful for this time to just now. Yeah, together. thanks so much, Olga. And, yeah. You no, know, it's my pleasure and more to come. And I'm looking forward to see you very, very soon again and have our yet another coffee together. And uh, yeah. April 16th, the... April 16th at the museum, ACM. Uh, yeah, April 16th. April 16th. Yeah, April 16th at the ACM you... Museum. Yeah. Okay, and I will make sure that I will uh, also tell uh, everybody on the social media and to my friends about it closer to the date. Uh, sure. Russell, there are a few questions here and there. Uh, there's one question that I just I'm not, uh, that I just see. How did you overcome the language barrier when you were uh, working? Uh, I'm not sure about the, oh, in, in China. When you were working in, in China? No, probably when you were working in Japan, I, I assume. Oh, uh... Well, 
yeah, it's like you try to learn as much as you can. But I also had a friend that was helping me out, a couple of friends that were helping me out. And actually now they do, they do understand more English, obviously, you know, because it's a new generation, okay. right? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, I didn't have a major problem with the language, you know. I always had people around, friends of mine, you know, that knew the family, that knew the, 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 the tea houses. And a lot of times they, they, they understand English a lot of times. Okay. I mean, it's a different world now. And, and yeah. uh, you know, these are younger people. So, you know, uh, very, very educated uh, ladies. Yeah. So they have they obviously yeah. spoken yeah. English. So, uh, sure. yeah, that, that, that part of it. And there's always a uh, you know, mobile phone, you know, translate. Yeah. <laughs> Audio translate. translate. That, always right. ha- that always That's helps, right. actually. Yes, yeah, but, yes. But, but, I use it all the time. Hand, yeah. It works. It well, works. It's amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, to all our listeners and all our viewers and our followers, thank you so much. For some of you who are not able to be with us tonight, I will be posting the link shortly on my stories and also on my feed. And uh, uh, the link will be recorded. And actually, the conversation will be recorded under the section of conversations at Events by Olga. And uh, I'm thanking you so very much, Russell, once again. Thanks, Olga. To be with us tonight and to take your time and uh, all the very best. And I can't wait for the exhibition opening and uh, to see you there, if not before. Yeah. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoy it. See you there at the museum. Absolutely. Thanks. Ciao. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Bye. I'll see you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.